afternoon. Uh, so, well, warm welcome to all of you. I am Shalab Bhatnagar. I am currently the chair of the Department of Computer Science and Automation. The department itself is completing, has completed 50 years and therefore we are celebrating the Golden Jubilee of the department this year. And as part of the Golden Jubilee Frontier Lecture Series, we have uh, been inviting very eminent speakers. And today's speaker is Dr. C. Mohan from uh, an IBM fellow at the IBM Almaden Research Center, a very highly distinguished scientist. So uh, to formally introduce him, I request Professor Jayant Harit, sir. So good afternoon and welcome again to this fourth lecture in the Frontier series which is commemorating the Golden Jubilee of the CSA department. And as Shalab said, we are absolutely delighted to have with us today as our distinguished lecturer for this uh, talk, Dr. C. Mohan, who is a database legend from the IBM's Almaden Research Center. Mohan received his undergraduate degree from IIT Madras and you might be surprised to know that this was in chemical engineering. In fact, he was a contemporary of our former dean, Professor Keshav Rao, and also Professor Gopinath of our CSA department was his classmate. But then what was chemical engineering's, engineering's loss was computer science's gain. He moved over to the dark side. He went to the University of Texas at Austin, where he joined the legendary Avi Silvershuts, and he did his PhD in the remarkably short period of just four years. Subsequently, in 1981, immediately after completing his PhD, Mohan then went to IBM's uh, research center in Almaden, and he has been there ever since. So in this fairly long stint of close to four decades at IBM, he has made several seminal contributions, and these are primarily with regard to the design and implementation of database engines, specifically on areas like how do you maintain database consistency and database durability. And what you would see is that one of the great things about Mohan's work is that all these ideas have not been just LaTeXware, they've actually found their way into products, and not just IBM products, but they've also pretty much influenced every commercial database engine that is there in the world today. In some flavor or the other, they have implemented these ideas. Okay? And I think this also explains the reason why we have a large industry presence here today. There's a big fan club of Mohan, and he maintains his web page assiduously, so <laughs> all his contributions are <laughs> reflected there. So many of them are here today, and we are very glad to host you here. So in Due to all these seminal contributions, Mohan has received a host of awards over the last few decades, and it will probably take me the entire hour here if I had to list all of them. Instead, just go to his webpage again and uh, look them up. I'll just mention a few highlights. He's a fellow of ACM, of IEEE, and of course of IBM, as uh, Shalab already mentioned. He also received the ACM Sigmod Innovations Award. But I think if I read him correctly, what he's perhaps proudest of is that he was one of the early distinguished alumnus of IIT Madras. <laughs> so in uh, recent years, Mohan has shifted his focus from the traditional relational database platforms to more contemporary architectures like those with a non-volatile memory or, or uh, things like blockchain. And in today's talk, actually, he will uh, 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 present to us his particular, uh, his views on the myths and realities of the current state of uh, blockchains, which has become a favorite buzzword in the industry. So with that uh, brief introduction, I'd like to invite Dr. C. Mohan to deliver his frontier lecture. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, really appreciate uh, all the nice things that were said. And uh, I feel like I'm coming back home kind of thing, even though I'm not an alumnus of IAC for uh, the longest time now. Thanks to my association with uh, Balki and various other people, uh, even getting involved in the first uh, global conference of uh, IASC alumni in the Bay Area to even the Centenary Conference and so on, I participated quite a bit. Uh, I was even in the panel on the future of the Electrical Sciences Division and things like that when Anurag asked me to be in that panel. So um, I have a long association. Of course, I know people like Jayanth from his PhD days, having been a database guy forever. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to be invited to, you know, be featured in this uh, Frontier series. And so congratulations on the 50th anniversary. So I was here, of course, for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the Institute itself. My company happens to be like three years or so younger than IASC. So it's a fond thing for me as an IBMer also. 
Um, in terms of the presentation itself, I am not, by no means an expert in this topic. My primary areas of work are the things that Jayant talked about, which has to do with transaction management and locking recovery and all these really gory stuff that easily put everybody to sleep. Um, but for the last three years or so, I've been paying attention to the blockchain area because I felt there was too much uh, silly stuff going on and uh, I should come in with a database perspective to see what this hype is all about. And So in that context, uh, there's a lot of material that uh, if you happen to get interested or you're already interested in the topic, you can find by going to the URL whose QR code is on the left side. And this one is uh, a, a QR code for a paper that uh, I wrote as part of the keynote I gave at the ACM SIGMOD conference this year. This was my very first SIGMOD keynote in all these decades of work I have done. This was in Amsterdam in July. So this is an easy to read paper, no algorithms, no formulas, this, that, no theory. But it's a nice intro for people and also there are tons of references to not just research papers, because there aren't that many research papers in this area that's of interest to me in a practical sense rather than esoteric stuff. But there's a lot of uh, information out there in the form of white papers and such, because as you will see, a lot of the work has been done more in industry way rather than research projects turning into products. And as a consequence, uh, the, it's hard to get at the details of how various things work. Also, people think, just because it's all open source, anyone and everyone can just look at the code and figure out the logic behind what the decisions were that the designers made and so on, which is not true, obviously. Um, so you will find it useful uh, to go look there. Um, if I had all the time in the world, and he conspired by scheduling this talk late in the day because he knows that I'm notorious for exceeding time limits, because I have a 6.15 flight to catch, he knew that he can shut me up really quickly by doing this talk late in the afternoon since uh, I have to catch the flight. So uh, if, if you want, you can actually go look at lots of videos that are pointed to from that initial URL I had, uh, where you'll see me, for instance, even debating with uh, Silvio Micali, the Turing Award winner from MIT, who has a company called Algorand based on an algorithm that he came up with for permissionless blockchain. So we butted heads in last year's uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Uh, were you there? Yeah, that was last. Oh, last to last year. So the, I'm talking about 2018 um, uh, HLF. I uh, had this great debate with him. And it's you can go look at the videotape of that. And you'll see why I'm very passionate about this topic. So I may not get to say everything I would like to say, or you might want me to say, or whatever. Uh, so you go, I welcome you to look at the uh, deck. By the way, I've already tweeted and posted on Facebook and so on the link to this set of slides. You will notice that if you see it in the slideshow mode, you will see the slides I'm showing now. But if you go into the edit mode, there are tons of hidden slides that will also uh, contain lots of interesting information. Um, so uh, the talk was intended from the time I gave it in uh, 2017, April, the first time in Hong Kong. I've already done it in 13 countries. And this Sunday, I'm going to do it in uh, New York University, Abu Dhabi. That will be the 14th country, believe it or not. The, the level of interest is unbelievable. And in most countries in this two and a half years, I've given it multiple times. and so totally disproportionate to the amount of real work I have done in this space. I never got this level of attention for all the other work that I did on Aries and things like that. So uh, I'll, I'll briefly describe the things uh, as to what happened and why it happened and so on. Uh, but in terms of systems that are out there that are of interest from the permission blockchain perspective, those are the ones in uh, green. Uh, I'll get to say a little bit about some of them. Uh, the one in red is the one that's getting a lot of attention these days because it's worked by Facebook to begin with, but it's supposed to be then uh, augmented by a whole bunch of members of the Libra Association. And it's very controversial. And Zuckerberg was being interviewed, uh, was being grilled in the Congress and such. And uh, even Trump was tweeting about uh, Libra and its policies. Part of the reason I've changed the color is also because it's a combination of a permissioned and permissionless uh, uh, approach. 
and maybe it doesn't make sense right now, but we, as we go on, we might, uh, you might figure out what I mean by that. So the whole thing got going pretty much about um, 10 years ago when an anonymous uh, author or authors, we don't know, by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto published this paper on Bitcoin and people are now you know, acting as if this is like the greatest thing since sliced bread and uh, all sorts of hoopla you'll hear about, some of which I mentioned in the subsequent slide. Uh, the idea being that uh, any number of people across the globe without having to reveal their identity by merely identifying a person or the same person potentially with multiple addresses uh, can send and receive money in the form of bitcoins. To me, this is mundane because why is money being sent around? Presumably because the other person, the recipient of the money provided some goods or services and they don't even model that. They get hung up on trying to make sure that the money that's being sent is actually money that the sender has and that the same money doesn't get sent to multiple people, the so-called double spend. But a lot of strange things happen in the system because they don't know the identity, the real world identities of the parties involved and the parties can, you know, at will come and go. So at any given time, you have no clue how many people are there. And so from a systems people perspective, this is all like mind bogglingly strange because providing scalability, performance and all that is a nightmare in this kind of circumstance. And also because you don't know anything about the trust nature of the individuals involved, they then go bonkers in trying to protect supposedly against all sorts of people colluding with one another and causing some chaos in the system, which is supposed to mean somebody rewrites history in a you know, joint fashion. This is in some sense like um, the different kinds of attacks that people talk about in the internet and so on. Um, but it's also, to me, very strange because you you unnecessarily create the problem by admitting people without knowing anything about them. And then you go crazy trying to protect yourself, thereby screwing up the mainline performance. By that, what I mean is, in order for transactions to be executed in this system, a transaction can be submitted, but in order for it to be processed, it has to be included in a block of transactions that gets created. Who gets to create the block? Somebody who wastes a lot of energy by solving a math problem, and if that person happens to be the first one or one of few who simultaneously solve the math problem, then they get to add a new block of transactions. And there's all sorts of craziness with this because there's this concept of a fee having to be paid for a transaction to be even considered to be executed, and the fees can vary, and also there's this notion of um, a reward being given to the people who get the privilege of adding a new block of transactions and the people also get to choose what transactions get included in a block. To me, all this is like greed and totally unnecessary in a really a traditional way of doing transaction processing and so on where you pay for the resources you consume and priorities are based on importance of the workload and things like that, not just based on who is willing to offer how much money and things like that. Yeah, I mean, even in Amazon and all that, you can choose you know, faster machine versus uh, slower machine or more resource owning machine versus this and so on. But the way it's done here is pretty arbitrary to, in many ways. Unfortunately, I don't have all the time to discuss all that. But the anonymity is also misused to essentially take fiat currency and convert it to the, this cryptocurrency. There are variations, not just Bitcoin, Ether and many others that have since come about. And this is a source of uh, money laundering and prostitution and uh, you know, people being uh, ripped off and so on. Uh, you know, malware being introduced and then if you want to get rid of it, you have to pay up money and things like that. So I'm not here to promote such things. So my goal is not to say, oh, anonymity is good and so I'm going to continue to persist in doing all this. You can tell me you know, garments are bad and so on, but don't get confused between having a way of anonymously reporting on bad behavior like whistleblowers and so on and blockchain. Unnecessarily people, you know, try to confuse matters by saying in some other environment anonymity might be good, but they are not necessarily the right use cases for blockchain. So don't bring up 
vacuous arguments uh, to justify some of the features that exist here. But more importantly, performance sucks big time. Seven transactions per second, give me a break in this day and age, when uh, 35 years ago, then the then goal was 1,000 transactions per second with sub-second response time, whereas here, it's like 10 minutes. And in between 35 years ago and now, with Web 2.0 companies, tens of milliseconds became the response time goal. So in, from that perspective also, this is all not very consistent. Um, in any case, there are a gazillion people across the world working on various aspects of such systems. But to me, what is really the worthwhile long-term thing to focus on? If you have infinite resources and you can do everything under the sun, be my guess, but the world is not like that. So when you have limited resources, at least direct them to working on stuff that's of much more practical value and long-term value. So what do I mean by all that? In a permission blockchain system, only those people who have a reason to be together and a need to know kind of situation who are working together on a business process or a, a workflow will be allowed to be part of a particular network that's intended to deal with transactions in that environment. And so by definition, you have to reveal your identity and it will still have many of the features that are there in terms of the underlying blockchain data structure which has some good properties to it. But it doesn't have to necessarily have its own cryptocurrency and things like that. And also performance is better because you have limited number of people being part of it, not some random guys who have nothing else to do suddenly becoming part of it. From an information revealing perspective also, over here it's open season. Anyone, anywhere can, at will come and go and also see what's going on. Whereas here, only the people who have a need to know will be able to see what's going on because they're the only parties that are admitted to such a network. And um, also, over here, Remember I said multiple people might win this competition to add a new block. What happens when multiple people actually win in a given uh, uh, mode, uh, given situation? You might have had a linear chain, one through n blocks, and then the n plus one block is to be added, but now two guys qualified. So you'll have n plus one prime and n plus two prime. And, sorry, n plus one double prime. So there's a branch now suddenly because two competing blocks are being added. So this leads to all sorts of chaos with this one. Because now you have to wait for a while and hope that asymptotically, the longer the path, the higher are the chances that ultimately that will be the winning path and the other paths will get discarded. So this is also part of the reason why the response time is 10 minutes. So there are many other aspects to this that I'm not getting into now, but typically in permission blockchain systems, they make sure it's deterministic by letting only one person at any given time be able to add a new block, okay? It may not be the same person that every time gets to add. Over time, it might be different people, but at, at any given point in the blockchain, the next block will be added in a non-ambiguous way. And uh, also, Typically, these systems don't have this notion of reward and you know how here the winner of the uh, competition not only gets to take money from the people whose transactions it chooses to add to the newly created block, but also the system itself is like a dog does a trick, you throw a few biscuits at it, the system itself, because they won the competition, throws a few bitcoins at them. To me, this is all like mumbo jumbo. And also, this guy cooked up that ultimately this is the maximum number of Bitcoins that can be there. What is the relationship to real world goods and services? Nothing. And why is that number special? Nothing. This guy just thought of it. So in that sense also, there is too much of, uh, you know, uh, fakeness about this or unreal aspect to this. So let's look at, in general, what makes sense to be talking about that you want to do in a blockchain way. So this picture depicts a business scenario. By business, don't again think that, oh, it's only useful for business to business, not for uh, consumer to consumer or business to consumer. All of that can be handled actually. Uh, but the general picture that I want you to get is the nodes in such a network are the organizations that are working together in a business process and the clients that will be in such a network will be the people of those organizations 
who like in traditional database systems and all that will have certain privileges with respect to what kind of transactions they are allowed to execute based on or permitted to execute based on their role in the organization. Okay, so and what is being done through such a network? Goods and services are being exchanged and the things that you are managing, let's call them assets, they can be purely digital assets like music recordings, videos and so on or digital representations of physical assets like diamonds and packages and airbags and car componentry and such. And what are the transactions doing? Transactions are making state changes to these assets or the digital representations of the assets which could have something to do with the ownership of the asset being changed. I sent Balki this package. So the owner was initially me and now Balki is the owner. Or in the case of let's say something like diamond, the raw diamond was mined and then you polished it. So that's a state change. Or the diamond gets split into smaller diamonds and so on. So what are smart contracts? These are the programs that are implementing the logic of the uh, blockchain transactions which codify the rules of engagement between the parties. This could be like the priest asking the bride and the groom, are you willing to marry this other person? And the logic behind, you know, what they think or how uh, they come to this decision and then communicate it is what's codified in these things. These are like the traditional workflow systems where how different organizations work with one another. These are the contracts that might have been in national, uh, natural language, which then get maybe, you know, documented like in traditional workflow systems, like in petri nets and so on, in a more formal way through which you can prove certain properties like liveness, deadlock free and such. And then you can generate machine executable versions of such contracts, right? This not, all, all of this doesn't mean that humans are not involved. They could still be part of the picture in terms of when this program is running, it could ask for input and things like that, right? Um, so these are the, and you can even think of them as like stored pr procedures in the case of database systems which are implementing the logic which has to do with how the assets are going to be manipulated. You read the states of the assets and then you come to some conclusions and then you modify the states of the assets by writing back information to the database system. You might even create new assets or destroy existing assets. And so what is special about all this? The way in which this is being done and the way you track stuff leveraging of uh, private key, public key and cryptography and also hashing and such that makes it be not completely tamper resistant but at least highly tolerant of uh, if tampering does happen those things being detectable. There is no such thing as 100% guarantee in this world, right? Even with disaster recovery systems and so on. So those sorts of caveats apply here too. And we'll see more of the fact that um, you know this way of doing it as opposed to traditional way allows you to track the provenance of these assets as they move around in the network and also do things in a way where it's much more granular than the traditional way in which things have been tracked and as a result sometimes mass recalls that are done today when you know salmonella poisoning happens or uh, seat belts are found to be faulty where unnecessarily not just the ones that have the faulty thing are recalled, but because of lack of information about it, where all the faulty things got incorporated, you do much more uh, wide-ranging kind of recalls and unnecessarily troubling people, wasting money and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's look at, for instance, an import-export scenario. There are many parties involved. If something is being shipped from, let's say, Hyderabad to the country of Georgia and it goes through Dubai, you won't believe, that, and this is actually a use case that was uh, prototyped by IBM Research guys, incredible number of parties are involved and they might all be using computers and exchanging electronic messages, but guess what? Typically, each of the parties involved has its own database system, own meaning what they are managing. It can be a standard database system. <coughs> and the programs that manipulate these things are also independent across the different nodes. And the exchanges might be more of point to point, EDI, XML, whatever, right? But there is no single source of truth. So at any given time, there might be, you know, uh, inconsistent information about the same thing across these different repositories. And as a consequence, there's a lot of inefficiency. And also if something goes wrong, like 
food gets spoiled because the truck's air conditioner is broken, and as a result, people die. Then the guy who was, you know, managing that truck wants to get the monkey off his back. He goes and changes the temperature that automatically got recorded to shift the blame to somebody else, at least not have the blame on him or her. Such things are harder to detect. The fact that the original recording got modified, uh, you know, illegally or whatever you want to call it. So uh, also, you know, when you ship something and the order was misunderstood and the wrong thing got shipped, there's a lot of back and forth and money gets tied up in the network and so on. Uh, who pays and such things. Whether the person was happy or not and who's responsible once the item gets shipped and the money is sent and then the item two days later breaks down, doesn't work. <coughs> so the blockchain way of doing the same thing in contrast is to have a set of programs that are jointly produced by the parties involved which all execute in all the nodes which manage the state changes in a way where the states that are represented in the different uh, nodes are replicas. So there's a single source of truth but it's a replicated source of truth. And there is a method to the madness in, with which the state changes are done, unlike here where each of the parties might independently do these things, supposedly based on information that's being exchanged, but not in an orderly fashion. So that's what the uh, selling proposition of this. But as you will see, it does cost something. So it's not like a uniformly better way of doing things because the performance can be worse than this chaotic way in which things are done today in terms of number of transactions per second and things like that. And, but here also we are leveraging, uh, you know, cryptography and such things so that once a party agrees to doing something, later on they cannot claim that they didn't agree to it because they would have digitally signed the fact that they agreed to it and such, which for the most part didn't exist in the traditional way of doing business. And so, um, and the way in which all this is being done is very different from the way, for instance, traditional um, workflow systems worked or business process systems worked. I had a project called Exotica in Almaden where we were working with IBM's Flowmark, which later on came to be called MQ Workflow. And so I know quite a bit about these sorts of things. Gustavo Alonso was my postdoc, for example, during that project. Um, and so compared to that, this is a much more fault tolerant way of doing business. And also it has all this uh, leveraging of cryptography and things like that that makes it far superior in many ways. So let's now go you know, sky high. What's the story with the state of the world with respect to these permission blockchain systems that I'm saying is the right thing to be focusing on? It's as if we are like 35 years ago, for those of you who are old enough, uh, in the relational database context where a few products had just come out, Oracle, DB2, and so on. But you as the user of such systems were left to your own devices to figure out under what conditions, what features to use. And the features were also not that sophisticated to begin with. And also the performance characteristics were not known. And um, comparison of performance across different systems uh, and such were not good. But we had a standard conceptual model, namely my colleague Ted Cord's relational model. For those of you who don't know, I come from the lab where relational was born, SQL was born, and so on. I joined the lab a little later, 38 years ago, the R star project, which is a follow-on to the System R project. System R was the context in which SQL got developed. Even though the conceptual model was the same between us and um, UC Berkeley, where Ingress was being developed, the APIs were different. Namely, they used, they came up with Quell, my predecessors came up with SQL, but in the final um, game, uh, SQL won. But here, in contrast with the uh, blockchain systems, not only are the APIs different, but even the underlying conceptual models, there's no commonality. So that's a bit of a chaos. But the good thing is that there aren't too many such systems, unlike in NoSQL and so on, where every small number of people get together or the same groups keep putting out new no SQL systems or variations of big data systems that leads to even more chaos. And if you aren't interested, I have other talks where I talk about all that. Here at least, 
because bulk of the work is being done in the form of consortia, the number of such consortia which are responsible for putting out these systems is small enough that there aren't too many systems. But still, if you are making choices now, you better do your homework and not just go by, oh, JP Morgan is uh, behind uh, Quorum, so I should just use it because I believe in JP Morgan. Guess what? A lot of the players in this arena are not sure about what's going to be the winning system and such. So they hedge their bets by having their feet in multiple camps. So JP Morgan is also part of, for instance, uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric project. <coughs> and um, of course, there are efforts, in my opinion, there are baby steps to standardization and also things like Transaction Processing Council, which came up in the relational context to compare systems across different vendors and so on, different kinds of workloads. Those sorts of things are being worked on because there's a Hyperledger Caliper project whose goal is to provide tools and benchmarks to compare system performances and such. Um, but it's also the case that compared to relational, the degree of progress, the rapidity with which things are being done is much higher now than in the good old days, partly because of uh, open source and things like that. Um, and also it turns out the question that keeps coming up is why do I need something called a blockchain system? Can't I just go mess around with the existing database systems and make them do certain things and not have this additional thing? Do I really need them? This is like saying, oh, Turing machines can be used to program anything. Why do you need anything beyond that? So. Why is SAP needed? Everybody could implement the logic that's in incorporated in SAP in your own application program. That's also a dumb statement because you don't want over and over the same stuff being rewritten and mistakes being made and so on. So this method to the madness with respect to the emergence of packaged software and so on. So that's the rationale that you should think of as to why, you know, growing your own work, uh, blockchain system is not a good idea because it takes a lot of effort and you can make mistakes and also you want across different uh, organizations these things to work and such in spite of the fact that there are no standards. At least if you use one system, you get standardization across the different participants in that uh, uh, particular instance of uh, 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 what do you call it now? In blockchain network, okay? So anyway, that's the sort of thing that's in progress. But of course, still, having said that, there are people who are adding blockchain-like features into traditional database systems, which would not obviously provide all the bells and whistles that you get out of a full-blown permission blockchain system. So in particular, you'll see in the next slide, um, for instance, um, Amazon announced something called the Quantum Leap Database, uh, and also even more recently, Oracle announced uh, a new type of table, just announcements, it's not yet available for you to play with, uh, which is a blockchain table which will have some of the characteristics like no in-place update and things like that. Uh, I can have a lengthier conversation about all this, but don't have the time. Uh, but one of the important developments is that just like you had platform as a service, uh, uh, infrastructure as a service, now there's a new class, which is blockchain as a service. What is it? It is a case where instead of yourself, these different organizations owning the machines and the associated data and such, you can palm it off to vendors who will do this as a managed service for you. This is like using, um, you know, Amazon or the IBM cloud instead of having your own installation and things like that. And in that context, it turns out the good news is that even though there are no standards, Hyperledger Fabric has become a favorite for all the vendors who are providing BAS offerings, blockchain as a service offerings, to support Hyperledger Fabric. They might support something else also, but this is the most favorite one. And there's a lot of um, production deployments that have happened in spite of the short time in which things have happened and the features are evolving and even some fundamental architectural changes are being introduced. For example, when Fabric went from 0.6 release to 1.0, it introduced the notion of uh, endorsing peers and non-endorsing peers, which didn't exist before. It also allowed you to have subsets of the existing network to form its own um, channel concept which is like a Venn diagram where 
all the things associated with the channel will be disjoined from the same sort of things associated with another channel. So you have a single network, but you can now further uh, segment who within that network gets to see certain set of transactions and things like that. For instance, Walmart with its own uh, suppliers uh, isolating what they are doing from uh, Safeway and its suppliers, some of whom might be common between the two and so on, from com for competitive reasons and all that. You might say, hey, why couldn't they be in two separate networks, but there are other benefits to be had by having them in the same network. So because Walmart and Safeway themselves might for certain things work together. So this is a world of cooperation and so on. So anyway, there's lots of stuff happening and many Chinese companies are also extremely active. And to me, to my knowledge, the first production deployment of a blockchain, permission blockchain system happened in February 2017 to manage private equity funds. What's so special about that? The number of transactions that happen in that space is pretty small but the value of each transaction is high. Millions of dollars get invested in private equity investments compared to, for instance, New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ where Mickey Mouse transactions happen, Mohan bought a share or sold a share of IBM and so on. But the number of such transactions is unbelievably high and blockchain systems are not capable at this point of handling that kind of volume and so on. So uh, there are various aspects to this kind of discussion that determine under what conditions it makes sense to use a blockchain system for a certain use case versus using traditional ways of doing transaction processing for other use cases based on your requirements and so on. So today, it's not the case that it's a clear-cut decision. It's a very binary thing. You have to look at different aspects of the particular situation, particular use case, before you arrive at the conclusion as to which way you should go. So it's not like you're going to get rid of traditional ways of doing business completely you know, tomorrow or some such thing. OK, uh, let's go on. So this is the point I made as to why Hyperledger Fabric is very popular. Um, now comes all these myths that I said I will bust, and I've already mentioned many of them. It's like a religious uh, belief you know, that many of the permissionless people uh, that are out there uh, hallelujah, and you know, world will be a better place if only fiat currency will be, will be thrown away and everybody will adopt cryptocurrency. You know, Argentina won't have all its problems, or Venezuela will, will not have all its problems if only they were using cryptocurrency. A lot of mumbo jumbo. You know, I come from Silicon Valley where I've lived for 38 years. I've seen the you know, VCs and entrepreneurs who are out to make a fast buck and all that. They'll do whatever will, in the short run, give them money whether in the long run it makes any sense or not. So for such reasons also, there is enormous hype associated with, so also are the research type people. This is like, uh, I call it, uh, I called it somewhere else, uh, uh, like a cottage industry to crank out new papers. Imagine all sorts of problems, esoteric things that are not necessarily going to have any practical impact. So they dream up all sorts of weirdo failure scenarios. My point is, why do you want to take on the job of allowing random characters to come in and then you go crazy and screw up mainline performance? When I walk on the street, I know there's a likelihood that I might be hit by a truck or a bicyclist or whatever. Do I, for that reason, every time I step onto the street, put on armor plating around myself, thereby constraining me in various ways, especially when the weather is hot and such, and also bulky to carry it around? And, so we make careful choices. So in the permissioned one, yeah, people could still try to misbehave and do some bad things. There's no different from an Uber driver or an Ola driver trying to rip you off. But in general, you know who the Ola driver is because the company tells you certain things. The company itself has a lot more information about the person's past activities and such. So if the person does misbehave, there are laws of the land that you can use to take them to task and kick them out of the network so they cannot be participants anymore and so on. So those are the sorts of reasons I give to say that going bonkers with this anonymity and Byzantine behavior and hence coming up with all this proof of work and so on and also making all these tall claims, I'm providing trust in a completely trustless environment and blah, 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 and there's no central authority and so on. By the same token, if you lose your wallet with a private key, you are screwed because 
you don't have a recourse to regaining that money that just poof disappeared or if somebody rips you off because of bugs in the software again these are problems that uh, they don't think about or want to admit to as being problematic and even this whole notion of everybody in a peer to peer, peer way will communicate and do things and no need for central authority is bogus in many ways because you're not using smoke signals and you know pigeons to carry the messages around so you are still using the telecom network and there aren't too many players there and so you are still dependent on that thing not being taken over or misbehaving or screwing up and things like that so there's lots of time I can spend this idea of Oh, random guy sitting in China or US uh, can validate your transaction. What does it mean to validate your transaction if you inserted the information that has to do with the temperature in this room right now? How can this guy algorithmically figure out whether what was inserted was the true value or it's some fake value? So as long as you have real world inputs going into this kind of a network rather than just this fake thing of cryptocurrency and money being generated within the system and being dispensed with within the system which is half the problem because you are not modeling the other side I'm, I'm sending money to Balki presumably because he provided some goods or services to me they don't model that aspect of it whether I'm happy with that thing that he did for me and getting only hung up on this money alone being not doubly spent or past being changed to me is very artificial and not really a useful thing. Even with respect to data, oh, you put something in the blockchain, it's there forever. So even if you delete it, it doesn't go away. Hence, sensitive information shouldn't be put there. Put it in an off-chain. Did something happen? Okay. Um, put it in an off-chain store and keep the hash alone in the blockchain. They think this will provide you much uh, better handling of uh, personally identifiable information and all that. But they don't talk about who's responsible for this off-chain store. Is it now some centralized thing and under one organization's control? What if that gets corrupted? All you'll discover is that when you compare the hash of the new version of the data with the original hash, you'll say, oh, this is the corrupted version, but you don't have recourse to the original version. And even if you replicate that thing, and if you legitimately modified it using programs, the modified version will also go to the copies. So ultimately, all of them will have the same non-original value. So there are many aspects to this and even otherwise in a traditional database system when you delete something it doesn't go away in the sense that it's still in the log, the fact that it existed originally and underwent state changes. People don't think of traditional database recovery log as having many similarities to the blockchain data structure. And so unless you vacuum clean the traditional log, merely dropping the object from the database is not giving you anything more than the same sort of thing being done here. So um, this is all for the more geeky crowd that uh, gets into all sorts of stuff. There's more slides here that I won't go through that says this is all bad uh, from a Nobel laureate uh, of uh, economics uh, in terms of the world has done all these things before in terms of small communities having their own currency and so on. There's a reason why we evolved to fiat currencies and in Europe they even came up with euro across country boundaries and so don't think that uh, you know there's something magical about this uh, revisionist history or whatever and there's also been a lot of ripoffs that have happened and even with Zcash and such bugs caused some weird behavior and they claim that not too many people exploited it because they kept it hush hush so people have too much faith in thinking that just because something is open source it's error free and this and that. So um, even this whole business of oh no intermediaries is bogus because people are worried about losing their um, wallet and hence losing access to the money and so they actually let exchanges manage their wallets and guess what that's a euphemism for a bank so much for the claim that permissionless systems are eliminating all these intermediaries and things like that. If you want a historical perspective of where the ideas in blockchain, in, in Bitcoin came from, it's not like this guy invented everything. It's actually a consolidation of ideas from the 80s, uh, Merkle trees and various other things. So you can go look at this paper if you are the researchy kind. There are all, all sorts of ideas from distributed systems and database systems that have a bearing on what's happening in the blockchain arena. I don't have the time to go through all this. A lot of these things I myself have worked on. Byzantine agreement which deals with you know Byzantine behavior 
has been in the works for as long as I've been in IBM. So in my own lab, Danny Dolev and Barbara Simons and Joe Halpern and Ray Strong and such people worked on clock synchronization algorithm, Byzantine agreement protocols. I myself had a paper on combining traditional two-phase comet with Byzantine agreement in port C83, principles of distributed computing system. So don't make it appear like this, this Bitcoin thinking about Byzantine behavior is something that we have not thought about. There are good reasons why a lot of those things have stayed more as research ideas and maybe prototypes, but not actually, you know, seriously on a day-to-day -day basis being leveraged. And uh, of course, in the database system, there are stored procedures and the kinds of distinctions between OLTP and OLAP and Web 2.0 coming in and so on. Uh, data. Uh, restrictions on transborder data flow and such, which are all relevant also in this context. So if you look at what's happening in a particular system, Hyperledger Fabric, you have the state, world state database. That's the one where the state of the assets, packages and such are being managed. That's very much an in-place updatable database. There's nothing immutable about it. What is immutable is this transaction history which is kept in a separate data structure. And the way this is being managed has many similarities to traditional recovery log, but it also has some additional things to make it more tamper proof and such. And this is where I was saying, this is a linear chain typically in all the systems I know of, permissioned, whereas in the permissionless, this is where like software versions, branches can happen and that causes enormous grief and such. Uh, and in this case, of course, um, this, what is recorded in this uh, uh, blockchain has certain similarities but also distinct things compared to traditional recovery logs. And so when I said blockchain transactions are causing state changes to this and that the, pr the logic behind that is coded up in these smart contracts, uh, it is at certain stage in this transaction processing that entries get put into this blockchain data structure. And there are details to be uh, you know, communicated about all this. So to take an example, a client might initiate a blockchain transaction just like you know, invoking a stored procedure with some input parameters. And as that thing executes, it makes database calls to that state database, retrieves information about the assets through get calls because it's at this point supporting a key value store kind of API. And then it will do some puts and deletes that represent state changes or ownership transfers. And while all this is going on, uh, one smart contract might invoke another, but ultimately when control goes back to the client, that designates the end of a blockchain transaction. Ideally, we would like each blockchain transactions messing around with the database system to be an asset transaction, but given that they are using these NoSQL systems and all that, which don't really have multi-statement transactions, all sorts of grief comes. And then they compensate for all that by making the layer above the database system do certain things which are rightfully best done within the database system. And so I'm not at all happy with such dumb APIs being supported instead of SQL, for example, and also the higher levels taking on database-like functionality. But today, this is the state of the world. And in particular, when the client invokes a, a blockchain transaction, it goes through a, an initial stage, which is a simulated execution of the transaction as depicted in the previous one. And in fact, multiple parties are involved in the simulation based on things like the priest asking the groom and the bride, are you willing to get married? Now this exactly how many people are involved and all that is a function of the use case. So the system provides the function flexibility to do various things, but you as the designer of the use case has to make the call. Uh, what happens here is that as these guys simulate the execution, they produce a read set and write set, which represents the data that was actually read and the writes represent the I, updates that are intended to be performed, but not actually performed because it's a simulation. The, these things get sent back to the client with the signatures of these endorsing peers. And then the client compares them, and if there is agreement, then now actually submits the transaction to the ordering service for it to actually get done, okay? 
but he is sending the simulated results with all the signature and such so people cannot later on claim they didn't agree. What does this guy do? At this point it's a very dumb thing. It collects many such transactions, read and write sets and just simply orders them without all this fee and this and that, you know, confusing the situation. And then sends this newly created block, how many entries are there and all that is irrelevant, okay, for the time being. Um, and these blocks, the, the new block, let's say, is sent to everybody, not just the ones who simulated before and all that. And these guys anyway don't have any memory of the simulation because they didn't do any persistent date state changes. They just sent back the stuff after simulation. They read it in write set and they forget that they even did the simulation. Of course, the information is recorded in that uh, block that's being created and sent uh, with respect to each transaction. What do these guys do? The difference between, by the way, the committing peer and the endorsing peers is that these guys don't have the smart contracts installed in them. So they don't even know the logic behind these transactions, whereas these guys do have smart contracts. But the smart contracts come into play only during the first stage. In the third stage, you pick up a transaction in order and then say, oh, this is the read set. Let me look up the current state of the assets, the objects mentioned in the read, state, uh, read set. Are those objects still in the same state? If they are, validation is successful. That means you can now just simply take the right set and dump it into the database and cause this transaction to get committed. If anything has changed and hence the validation fails, you just simply say this transaction is a loser and nothing is recorded persistently. Of course, that transaction exists in the newly created block, but there is a additional state that's recorded, metadata, which says this guy is a loser and hence none of his updates made it into the state database. The idea is that in spite of these nodes not communicating with one another during this third phase, and nor do they communicate actually even during the first phase, they will all come to the same conclusion, namely, if the third transaction for one guy in a particular block was deemed to be unsuccessful, because the validation failed, it would be the case that all the other nodes will also come to the same conclusion. So essentially this guy is just monitoring the progress of the state changes. Presumably it will be used to do some analytics or kick off some backend processing to be done. Whereas these guys, they are also party to deciding whether or not certain transactions will get um, committed or not committed and such. There is lots of stuff that database guys can get hung up about. What happens if you change the API from get, put, delete to SQL, select, insert, update, uh, uh, delete, and uh, invoke stored procedures, and so on. This idea of the upper level figuring out what was read and what was intended to be modified gets really complicated if you have to deal with SQL and not these very ultra simple APIs. The ultra simple APIs are, in my opinion, bad thing because these are even worse than pre-relational systems like IMS and VSAM and ISAM where you have primary key and then multiple fields which are individually named and can be referred to in retrievals and updates and such. Whereas here, it's primary key and then a bag of bits. And uh, you are becoming too dependent on the application programmers, in this case, the smart contract writers, to not screw up and do the right things and so on. So to me, this is like really a giantly backwards from mankind with respect to the power with which people can model their resources and such. So um, anyway, th th I can spend time on this talking to various people about what's so bad about all this. In terms of use cases, they're all over the map, not just in the financial domain. Uh, and many of these things are in production deployment in spite of the uh, infant nature of this technology, which is, like I said before, very different from the way relational systems evolved and how long it took for them to get into production deployments and so on. Uh, there are many use cases here. I'll just rush through food safety with Walmart, which allows you to you know, go from six days plus time taking, being taken to figure out when you pick up a package in the supermarket to know exactly where that uh, ingredient came from or whatever to 2.2 seconds, that kind of um, improvement. This, the information that's being tracked to enable such a thing can be used for various optimizations that are now 
uh, uh, possible to do. And uh, the other one is um, global trade digitization, the import-export kind of scenario that I provided. This also, there's a lot of benefits to be had by doing things in the blockchain way. This has to do with the fact that so much money is involved in global trade and any improvements there could provide lots of uh, benefits to all the parties involved and such. Fake things being shipped around or you know, highway robbery kind of things that might happen in the seas and such. Uh, and hence somebody substitutes the real thing with a fake thing and all that could also be uh, identified and tracked and such. Governments are also trying to leverage it. In this context, I should mention tomorrow I'll be at the Tamil Nadu e-governance agency in Chennai. And Tamil Nadu in its latest budget session, the chief minister has announced this mega project called, those of you who know Tamil, Nambikai Unayam, this is a cutesy translation of blockchain, Nambikai Unayam. Uh, I thought this was nice. Uh, they want to deploy a blockchain backbone and then the other departments, not the TNEGA, will provide the uh, use cases and implement uh, those things, solutions, if you like, that leverage the backbone. 70 million people in the country. Dubai kind of places have Mickey Mouse populations compared to this kind of scale. So if it does actually get done, and I'm supposed to be acting like a, an advisor for them, um, this will be the world's m most uh, comprehensive kind of in terms of scale uh, deployment of blockchain technology. But these guys in Dubai, this number has been revised, uh, want to become paperless with respect to government activities by 2021. Uh, and so there's lots of things being done over there. There are many other use cases where one can leverage blockchain, uh, energy management, even with homegrown uh, solar energy and such being pushed into the grid, even recycling, supply chains, of course, so we already talked about, uh, carbon tax and so on. So let's get back to the discussion of technical stuff. If you look at, in a gross fashion, the architecture of a blockchain system, there are three aspects to it. The consensus layer, which has to do with who gets to add a new block of transactions, uh, the exact way in which the logic behind the smart contracts are allowed to be expressed. There are restrictions placed, for example, here, in order to have deterministic uh, results to be produced things like RAND function being invoked or uh, current time and all that being uh, referred to is disallowed in even the language uh, uh, itself might be a special language. Like in Ethereum, um, they have a language called solidity. Uh, so whether you run this in a container or not and all that are various uh, differences across systems. And the database system also, even though I mentioned CouchDB and LevelDB are being used in Fabric. There are other systems which use even relational system. And so, in general, the point is that for different architectural features, different systems have made different choices, and they are not always well documented, well explained, and rationalized, and compared, and all that kind of stuff. Partly also, I would say, because of the history I said with respect to the evolution of this stuff, it hasn't come from traditional research. People came up with ideas, pro, you know, prototyped it, wrote papers, and then gradually these things got into the technology transfer mode. Instead, a lot of product type people have worked on these things, and they are not always good about doing the sorts of things that we might do in the research community. So there's, in terms of scope for research by industry people or academics and you know, nonprofits and even national labs, there's lots of work to be done to get things to a much more mature state and also usable state and things like that. But of course, there are still people out there that are not just merely prototyping or doing proofs of concept, but in fact are deploying them in production way because there is some benefit to be had from being leader of the industry and leveraging some modern technology because you might then have competitive advantage and so on. Um, as I said before, there are many similarities between blockchains and uh, logs, and also database replication. We can talk about how data and traditional distributed databases get propagated compared to the way in which it's being done. So the rest of the slides I'll just flip through, just so you know. Uh, this is this decision. Uh, uh, this is the uh, 
way in which you, you know, figure out in a given use case which way to go and so on. You'll see lots of charts like this. How you can still have the, the blockchain way of doing business interface, interacting with traditional backend system. You might accept an order through the blockchain, but the actual manufacturing of the order might make use of your traditional backend system. So there's stuff triggering and events uh, being propagated between both sides and such. How do you go from that chaotic left-hand side to the you know, nicer-looking right-hand side? It's not just that you roll in this new uh, beast, new, new system, that magically everything will be better. You do have to transform the existing messy way of doing business. So how do you go about doing that? There are various approaches, democratic versus the leaders of the pack sitting around the table and figuring out what the smart contracts are, what the new rules of engagement. And then there's discussion about the blockchain as a service offering, how do you deal with uh, a real diamond being replaced along this chain with a fake one? How do you uniquely identify a particular instance of the asset, of a physical asset, so that people can validate along the way whether or not it is still the real thing? So IBM worked on something called uh, Crypto Anchor and Crypto Anchor Verifier, which is like a, a lens you attach to the cell phone camera which can take microscoping measurements based on whether it's olive oil, viscosity being measured, or cotton, some spectral value and such. Uh, so these are exciting ways in which you can, just like with currency and uh, Gucci bags and such where they use various uh, markers and such, uh, people are working on now providing for authenticity and such. So uh, there are various things I could talk about that I won't now uh, as to how you went from Bitcoin to Ethereum to uh, private version of Ethereum, uh, how you know Quorum was developed and then the formation of the Hyperledger Consortium by IBM with the initial system developed within the company, Fabric, the uh, subsequent name given to it, uh, causing a whole new way of doing systems development in the blockchain context emerging with the establishment of Hyperledger Consortium in the Linux Foundation and various projects and how they are evolving, uh, how even in the fabric from 0.6, 1.0 came about and with some major differences and then discussion of Libra, how Corda is something that was developed by another consortium and how it has its conceptual model which has built-in features that have to do with the financial industry that are not uh, built in in the fabric, for instance, because it's intended for a much more general kind of environment. How within the Hyperledger Consortium itself, there are competing projects. The attempt is not to come out with a single agreed upon system. Multiple flowers are allowed to bloom. So Intel initiated the project called Sawtooth. SAP has come up with something which is an attempt to have their own API. And then they'll translate from that API to one of the chosen systems that you might be interested in and over time the claim is that you can switch from this system to that system but you don't have to change your API but it is still a, in my opinion an experiment because is this API a least common denominator of the APIs that are supported below if you choose something more powerful and then later on you switch to a system that's less powerful who does the compensation of the missing functionality in terms of various topics that can be worked on this is just a small list you can think of many other things, but in essence, I call this, um, there are numerous research possibilities for people working in the database and distributed systems, as well as cryptography and so on. And it's like a new era in distributed computing, sorry. And if you want to follow all the different things that I keep working on and all that, uh, there are various places you can go. And like I said, the slide deck is already available because I've tweeted about it and posted in Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. Thank you. I don't know what I did with the time. Uh, so thank you, Mohan, for a highly nuanced and thought-provoking talk. And he managed to compress a full-day tutorial into just <laughs> one hour. Yeah. So maybe we'll just have one or two questions, especially those from the permissionless group, who we'll probably <laughs> have a few issues to, uh, to talk to about him. So yeah, uh, Partha. Yeah. I'm just curious about the state uh, of going from natural language contracts to uh, codified contracts. So what's kind of like the current Well, so there are contracts? people working, to my knowledge, uh, within IBM, also there are multiple uh, labs that are working on that. Um, but 
I wouldn't say that uh, it's in a very mature state at this point uh, because, you know, there are related things that are happening even in the context of, for instance, um, compare and comply. This is a project in Almaden that's now, I think, commercialized, which is uh, you have certain rules and you have some systems that are supposedly implementing those rules, government regulations, whatever, and the government revises those regulations. Now they are, these are, you know, NLP type people who are now looking at the new regulations and they are supposed to now figure out are what, what, are, what is the impact of these new regulations on what's already implemented and where are the, what are the places where something might have to be tweaked and things like that. Um, so there are also people saying, you know, you can look at something that might be described in a sort of a template kind of fashion in the case of what might not necessarily be full-blown natural language and from that going to a more formal looking thing. Like I said, you know, in the age old days, it's going to petri nets and then trying to model. So of course, the, the, the Bitcoin guys came up with this UTXO model for representing how money that uh, he has, he might then split into two parts and send to two different people. And it's like tokens flying in the petri net or in distributed simulation systems, you have also these things that are floating around and that might then get even split and things like that. A single thing might get uh, cloned and so on. So there are many things like that that are still being worked on, but there was a dark stool on some of those sorts of things. I wasn't there. We had a dark stool at the end of June on permission, data, uh, permission systems and databases, and the report will just be coming out now any time. Uh, but there's lots of uh, unknown things and uh, more uh, qualitative kinds of things being said about, I think this is better, this is a better way of doing something versus that way of doing it. And so I would rather see people focusing on those sorts of issues than going off the deep end with some of the really esoteric stuff that's being worked on with weird failures and collusion and all this kind of stuff that uh, people are focusing on, not just in the research community, but even lots of startups and this and that that are hyping like crazy this whole uh, crypto business and it's like pyramid schemes and such you know in my opinion and, and, and the valley is full of these sorts of uh, people not just entrepreneurs but even VCs. Any other? Yeah, Maybe we can have one last question because <coughs> as you can see Mohan likes long answers so we have one last question. <laughs> Uh, hello, sir. I am uh, from Masters uh, here. So my question is, uh, in a permission or a private uh, blockchain network, how you are guaranteeing double spending issue given there is no consensus? First of all, I'm not even necessarily talking about any cryptocurrency being there. So don't even necessarily assume this double spend is something fundamental and every system that's out there has to okay. worry about it. So th in my opinion, some of these sorts of things are, uh, you know, imaginary things that have given that have been given too much prominence by the initial focus in the uh, bitcoin paper uh, what is there to talk about double spend in this context where i'm talking about even physical goods and so on if there is no cryptocurrency involved what does double spend mean the same physical item being sent to two different people that's not even possible right i I'd rather worry about what i said before which is somebody substituting the real thing with a fake thing or olive oil being adulterated with... Uh, that's immutability. Right? That's the sort of thing that some of those slides that I yeah. went through quickly, that crypto anchor stuff yeah. is being worried about. So uh, this whole notion of consensus and such is also something that, in my opinion, is all... All that's happening is that these transactions are getting ordered in a certain fashion, not necessarily based on any mm. important uh, optimizations being thought about. It's not like even in fabric, when the guy produces a list of transactions, it's not trying to minimize the number of transactions that might get aborted or not committed. Yeah. Okay. In database systems, when we have a deadlock, in order to resolve a deadlock, we'll do things like, let's pick as a victim a transaction which has done the minimal amount of work yeah. so that we can overall Abort. reduce wastage and such. Yeah. No such things is being done. Whereas, as I said, in the permissionless one, 
they try to game the thing by picking those transactions which will cost the guy who is doing this, putting together of transactions, more money, which might not have anything to do with what's beneficial in the real world and so on. Schedulers have worked on things like this based on priorities and such in operating systems, but that's not the sort of thing that's being uh, thought about here. So. I know, I'm giving long answers, okay, sorry. Sir. Okay. Because <laughs> uh, there's so, so much interrelationship between all this. It's not like a one, uh, you ask one question because the fundamentals of that question itself might not be valid because this has been made into a big deal concept by people who are barking up the wrong tree in my opinion. Anything else? Okay, okay. so on that okay. Uh, strong philosophical note. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, please join me in thanking Mohan again for an extremely energetic and passionate talk. Thank you. Uh, and as a small token of our appreciation, oh. I'll request our former Associate Director, Professor N. Balakrishnan, to please come and give this uh, <laughs> memento to Dr. C. Mohan. Oh, wow. Please. He's being very formal. This is the mug and the Thank you, sir. Hey, super thank you. Pleasure. Keep coming here very often. It's your second home. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks for your patience on a Friday. Today's no, sorry, not Friday, Thursday. But with all the commute traffic, whatever. I really appreciate it. I wish I could hang around, but I've been told that I should take off from here at four since the flight is at six fifteen and I have check in luggage. And he also needs to have the high tea for which I'd like to invite all of you, which is in the neighboring foyer. Thank you.